financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host, Shane and Kyle, as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vani Podcast. And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm Shane and... I am the Kyle. The Kyle, okay, okay. Well, we, we definitely hope you've had a terrific week and we thank you so much for tuning in uh, to the show. And uh, Kyle, why don't you go ahead and uh, bipcod this thing for us. Since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, the Vanu podcast is covered by a BIPCOT no government license. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at BIPCOT.org. Thank you very much for your service, sir. Uh, so, Kyle, how, how are things going on your end, man? Uh, I guess uh, what's, what's new? Well, I, I guess in one sense, things have been uh, busy and hectic. Uh, I did finish writing the uh, biography of Lavoie Finicum, which was which was interesting in terms of uh, uh, writing down some of the history of the Patriot movement, at least in some sense. And it's not done yet, but that, that was a portion of it. Um, I've got some other upcoming articles and such, but uh, you know, you know, things could things could always be better. Things things could also be worse too, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, well, glad things are going good, and that's the thing that you're you're staying busy as uh, as usual. But uh, I do want to make uh, one quick relevant announcement, uh, and then you know one proposal. I'll be attending the, uh, this year's Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest from June 22nd to June the 26th in Delton, Michigan. Uh, I've been out to it twice before, and I've always had a great time. If you're in the area, I'd recommend coming out. And if you aren't, consider making the trip anyways. People come from all over uh, to attend the Midwest Peace and Liberty Festival. I mention this because I will be giving a presentation on Vanu. This will be the first time most of these folks have ever heard of this strategy, so it is bound to be a good time, as long as the few political crusaders there don't make a huge fuss, which is possible, I suppose. <laughs> on top of that, there are a few TVP listeners that will be there, and uh, we'll definitely be having some private discussions on Vanu. Uh, time will not be a concern, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, or whatever. You know, just just be around uh, other people interested uh, in the strategy that we uh, that this podcast is centered around. Again, the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest is from June the 22nd to June the 26th. And for more information, please visit mplfest.org. Again, that's mplfest.org. Lastly, we'd like to do a Q&A episode at some points, and would love any questions you may have on Vanu, Rayo. Uh, or whatever hell, whatever the hell else we've already discussed on this podcast. Uh, just email either of us, Shane at VonniePodcast.com, uh, or Kyle at VonniePodcast.com, uh, and you can always uh, drop us a note on our fascist book page. Uh, so Kyle, I, I know I hadn't talked to you about that, uh, but but I think you know a Q and A episode. Uh, you know if there if there are any uh, uh, questions out there, you know obviously you know the best format to to answer those, right? Yeah, I, I think that's definitely a good episode, uh, considering the amount of uh, material that's already been put out. And so, yes, if, if people want to submit those lovely questions and uh, points of clarification and whatever else, yeah, I mean, definitely, I, I, I would certainly encourage that, considering that uh, Vanu has been kind of uh, publicly dormant for like four decades. So, yes, in order to help bring it back, some audience participation, at least in some sense, would definitely be good in the form of a q and I think that that's fine. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I guess I guess also too another possibility is you know if you if you're listening to the podcast and, and you're you just you, you still aren't convinced that you know uh, we haven't gotten to the action portion yet so we still haven't gotten what, gotten done with our convincing but uh, but you know if I mean even questions like well, why the hell should I care about Vanu I mean whatever the questions are I'd be happy to answer them uh, um, so so there you have it so uh, I, I think that's it Kyle uh, anything else uh, or are you ready to uh, dig in well considering the nature of this particular episode let's go ahead and dive into it. <laughs> Very good. So this episode is entitled The Philosophy of Vanu, concluding season one, and the show notes can be found at vanupodcast.com forward slash 13. As is quite obvious, today we'll be closing out season one. Uh, the plan is to go over the important definitions, the most crucial things to carry into season two, uh, as well as uh, solidifying the theory behind Vanu. And uh, to, uh, nor, uh, near the end of the podcast, we'll provide some closing thoughts uh, that I think you guys will, will find quite valuable. This will be a shorter episode, but we decided uh, this was uh, an important episode to close out the season with. 
we did cover quite a lot in a short amount of time, as, as Kyle kind of mentioned uh, just a moment ago. So what, the, the plan here is to, you know, go through each episode, obviously. Um, so we're, it's going to be kind of, uh, you know, divided up in that way. We'll go over the definitions, a brief overview, and, uh, yeah, you know, the, the important takeaways. So uh, number one. Uh, maybe the most important episode we did, Kyle. Uh, <laughs> you know, because the rest of them really don't make it make a uh, make any bit of sense without this one. But uh, number one, an introduction to Vanu. Uh, so, Kyle, uh, the only definition we have here, uh, you know, for the sake of time, is Vanu. So, what is Vanu? Well, Vanu is defined as the condition or quality of, as well as the action of achieving an invulnerability to coercion quick and uh, well put. Uh, so yeah, I guess a, a brief overview. We, we, we kind of went through uh, uh, Rayo's background, which uh, uh, which is more more so just interesting uh, in, in, in libertarian history as well as uh, what it was, uh, obviously uh, as well as what he put into his book. We let out the uh, the various uh, grammatical variations of the word Vani, which can be found at the definitions page. Uh, it's vanipodcast.com forward slash definitions. Uh, definitely make sure you go check that out. And uh, uh, I know we covered uh, uh, Benjamin Best's article to give you a little more insight into Rayo, but but generally this episode was just to, uh, you know, obviously provide the provide the, the the very very you know first foundation for for the rest of the podcast. But uh, Kyle, what what do you think are the most important takeaways, or what did I just forget to mention? I think the only thing to really other otherwise mention here, just really in transitory passing, because this is a brief overview, is how Rayo defined freedom and liberty and then contrasting that with Vanu. So just to cover that briefly here, uh, freedom is the absence of uh, coercion. Whereas liberty is the general exemption from coercion. And so then, of course, Vanu being the invulnerability to coercion. Very good. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, glad you mentioned that. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. But uh, anything else? Well, let's let's keep going. Okay. So uh, I think we'll cover these next two uh, in one. Uh, um, so number two, Anarchic Vanu Part One, and number three, Anarchic Vanu Part Two. So in these episodes, we 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 literally just combined uh, or we just compared and contrasted the direct action between Vanu uh, and uh, various anarchic schools of thought. Um, and we'll we'll definitely you know get into a little more detail in this. Uh, um, you know, in the uh, Libertarians and Coercivist article. Uh, a couple of those that are mentioned uh, near the end of this, uh, but yeah, in, in essence, we are just you know uh, providing you know some some comparing and contrasting to, to show you what Vanu is uh, and what Vanu isn't. Uh, so uh, turn it over to you, Kyle. Uh, the only other really thing to say really here about uh, the two-parter anarchic Vanu episodes really is that you know Vanu is not anarchic at least at least in one sense. However, there are certain similarities it can share with with at least some of those schools, and I and I think the most salient comparisons would probably be with Agorism more so than anything else. And that's my not so humble opinion. <laughs> I I would uh, I would have to agree. I would have to agree. Um, and obviously, just just real quick, uh, uh, Rayo had a terrible understanding of anarchism, which we'll get into again uh, in Libertarians versus Coercivist article here in just a moment. But uh, uh, anything else? Or are we ready to move forward? Let's let's keep going. Okay, so number four, uh, legal interstices. Are you exempted from tyranny? Uh, so Kyle, what are legal interstices? Legal interstices are defined as gray areas within the law that can be used to violate the spirit of the law while simultaneously keeping the letter of the law. Okay, very good. So I guess, I guess just a, a brief overview here. Um, you know, legal interstices, uh, Rayo used them. And, uh, you know, they, they, they can be useful uh, if there's no, you know, uh, a Vanu alternative available. Um, so I guess the, the long and short of it is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, legal interstices such as, you know, a driver's license, car registration, things like that uh, for, for van nomadism, uh, those are, you know, useful interstices if you're going to try to be, become invulnerable to coercion. Uh, without those, yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to be aggressed upon, unfortunately, li likely uh, aggressed upon. So they, I mean, uh, they aren't to be relied upon, but uh, but they are useful. So uh, anything else on that, Kyle? Yeah, let me just expand upon something here as briefly as I can. Way too many people place way too much faith in the efficacy of legal interstices. This is not to say that some particular interstices uh, either are or are not efficacious. It really kind of does situationally and circumstantially depend on which ones we're specifically talking about and how they're being used to accomplish certain ends and all that, because some of them do work better than others. I mean, for instance, I canceled my voter registration back in 2013, for example. So 
Uh, but then there are other things when people try to exploit it and it doesn't work. It backfires and things go from, you know, whatever the situation was before to something noticeably worse. So the concept of blowback actually is applicable to some interstices that aren't efficacious. So the interstices on a good day are a double-edged sword. They can either work for you or not work for you. It just depends which ones we're talking about. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed, and uh, I mean, uh, yeah, not to be not to be relied upon, but uh, as we'll get into, uh, uh, you know, and in, in definitely in, se in uh, season two and season three, uh, country shopping, and, and uh, definitely, you know, there, there is some some legal interstice uh, legal legal interstices involved there. So, uh, anything on that? Um, I'll just further add, even with the van nomadism, there's legal interstices as well. Yep, that is true. That is true. So. Uh, these next three episodes, which will probably, you know, consist most of consist of uh, most of uh, uh, this episode, just because uh, the sheer importance and it really provides, uh, you know, the the motivation uh, behind volume. So, uh, number five, uh, political crusading, bullshit libertarianism, sheep people, and bullshitters. And if you're listening to this episode and you haven't listened to the rest of these, I don't know what you're doing, but uh, but those are those are uh, all terms that uh, Ray used in his book. They weren't, uh, you know, my inventions or Kyle's inventions or anything like that. So, uh, definitions. Uh, Kyle, what is political crusading? Political crusading is defined as any attempt at working inside of the system in order to change it from within. In other words, it is applied collectivism. Yes, yes, it definitely is. It definitely is. So, I mean, uh, I'll just lead off with you this time. I mean, what do you think are the most important takeaways from from this episode? The first and probably most important thing is that Vanu is inherently anti-political, and so it does share that with like to at least well, well, it should be all of the anarchic schools, but like most explicitly with voluntarism and agorism, in 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 the sense that Vanu rejects. Uh, reformism. It rejects reformism. It rejects political crusading. It rejects and rejects also the methods thereof, which, of course, I mean, that was kind of the whole point behind my first book, An Elusive Phantom of Hope, A Critique of Reformism, that came out, I think that was in 2015, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, so that's that's just kind of it. So all those different methods, the voting, the grassroots lobbying, the protesting, the all those many different things I've written about and, and whatever else, uh, all of that political crusading, basically begging and scraping before those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers for concessions, and, for concessions, compromises, and, and undue favors and such, all of that is basically different shades and flavors of, of political crusading. And you cannot gain, you cannot gain freedom, you cannot rescue your liberty or secure your liberty, and you sure as hell don't have any Vanu if that is. If if political crusading is how you want to is how you want to gain any degree of protection against coercion, yes. And I guess just just one other thing here, and it'll go go along with what you said. But you know, Vanu um, is based on reality, not legality. Uh, so obviously, you know, uh, as you kind of said, uh, using political crusading, any of the the methods thereof. Uh, if you think using any of those methods can can restore your freedom, then uh, sorry, bud, you aren't living in reality. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, uh, so I guess just, just, uh, leave it at that or you got anything else? One further thing, just to distinguish it from legal interstices, legal interstices are about, about basically exploiting loopholes that are, uh, in the, you know, as, as they are today, right? It's not about changing the laws or whatever. Political crusading by contrast is about changing the laws and, and never endingly changing the laws and, and, and such. So that, that's kind of the key uh, difference between those two. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, uh, episode number six, Controlled Schizophrenia, uh, probably where we lost most of, uh, uh, if, not, if we didn't lose uh, some listeners uh, in number five, Political Crusading, uh, probably lost some here in Controlled Schizophrenia, but uh, Kyle, what is Controlled Schizophrenia? Controlled Schizophrenia is defined as the mental state of an opportunistic citizen serf within the servile society who practices doublethink, yet who still acts in his own best interest. For example, political crusaders are uh, a type of this in action. Okay, very good, very good. So uh, I guess just, uh, uh, well, hell, I'll turn it over to you again because I took the first few. Uh, uh, what, what, are the, what are the most important things to take away from, uh, from this episode? Well, essentially controlled schizophrenia is it's, it's hypocrisy. And in some ways it's almost worse than an explicitly acknowledged hypocrisy in that it is a hypocrisy in denial. Or in a slightly different vein or, or nuance, I guess you could also say controlled schizophrenia is an unacknowledged 
hypocrisy, uh, where you have people basically uh, doing things like they register for the draft, but then they go to college in order to be made a technician instead of a target. Uh, they may accept some sort of religious norms, but they're not above having a drink at a nude bar. Uh, you know, they may be rational in their work, but they don't dare look at their entire life rationally as a whole uh, because they prefer to be compartmented, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, any sort of inherent contradictions in one's lifestyle um, and, and so forth and any sort of split between means and ends, you know, ends means consistency or good old-fashioned integrity – that that pretty much is our kind of the the call signs of what would more likely than not be be some form of controlled schizophrenia. Yes, yes, and I think that was a pretty good overview. I don't have anything to add there. Uh, I, I really don't. So you covered that uh, pretty succinctly. But uh, uh, so uh, move forward. I would just say that one one final observation: political crusading would also be a form of controlled schizophrenia as well. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely would be. It definitely would be. Um, so uh, uh, number seven, collective movementism and utopias. Uh, so Kyle, what is collective movementism? Collective movementism is defined as an aggregate set of behaviors and actions that are aimed towards large-scale sociopolitical change in the furtherance of specific goals. Examples include the environmentalist movement, the alt-right, the labor movement, the libertarian movement, the public lands movement, the anti-war movement, the gay rights movement, the women's rights movement, and the civil rights movement, among many, many others. It's a lot of movements. <laughs> yeah, cult, yeah, cultural bowel movement much? Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, I guess we'll, we'll go through the definitions, uh, all the definitions we have, and then we'll, we'll start to talk about it. But what are utopias? Utopias are defined as an imagined place or state of things in which everything is perfect. The etymology for the word utopia literally means nowhere and was coined by uh, St. Thomas More. Okay, very good. And what is a, a cultural revolution? A cultural revolution is defined as a fundamental change in the world views ethical values, and or political attitudes of most people. Okay, very good, very good. So, so I think just a, a, a brief overview of, of this episode. We, uh, we, we examined, um, uh, I guess Rayo specifically mentioned uh, limited government libertarians and anarcho-capitalists uh, in his book, so we, we spent some time talking about that. Uh, which uh, which was which was interesting, and both of those would be would be utopias uh, in Rayo's mind, and I, I would say I would say in mine as well. And then we just, you know, uh, I guess laid out the reasons why collective movementism doesn't work. Uh, and then, Kyle, you also uh, um, tried to uh, uh, destroy collective movementism altogether, I think, with, uh, with argumentation ethics. Uh, <laughs> I think it, with this was the episode where you, where you did that. Uh, yes. but, but I guess just, uh, uh, I guess one, one, one of the most important things um, about, uh, you know, collective movementism is the, the inefficacious, um, inefficaciousness, if that's a word, uh, of it. Uh, reason being... Uh, the, uh, obviously, you know, these groups need, I mean, they're movements, they need people. Um, they need more people to join, they need more people to donate, they need more people to, to spread the good word. Uh, and uh, as is what happens with, uh, with every movement, um, the larger the group gets, the more diluted the message becomes, and the further away from the, you know, original, you know, goals uh, uh, the group gets. Uh, and that's just, that's inevitable. Uh, it necessarily has to happen, because for more people to join, uh, there has to be, a, you know, a wider appeal. Uh, so I think that's uh, uh, the most important thing, you know, just uh, regards to efficacy. Uh, they just can't work. Uh, they can never achieve um, their original stated goals. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Kyle. Yes, that's 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 largely correct. And so just to reiterate, at least at least in some sense, so those socio-political movements are doomed to failure. They are doomed to failure because, again, to reiterate, as you have the original batch of folks who are, let's say, the hardcore ones and all that, who actually believe, genuinely believe in their ideas and so forth, and at least try to be consistent, at least presumably so, at least to the extent that they can be, depending on what those ideas are, uh, they, they basically, as time goes on and there's more people, it dilutes it. So it is, it is, it is, uh, geez, I guess it is a zero-sum game, actually, isn't it? Would probably be the simplest way of putting it. Because you can either have uh, a relatively like super minority who are, I guess you could call them purists, and I mean that in a, in a good way, 
uh, but then or the other choice is that you can have lots and lots and lots of people or mass adoption or or a mass, right? Uh, but then, you know, the critical mass, but there's like no integrity. There's not even the pretense of integrity, right? It's all go along to get along and compromise, compromise and, and so forth. And so, yeah, uh, they can never achieve their stated goals of whatever it all is. So, yeah, if people want to get you to join a movement. Um, yeah, if you want to if you kind of want to shoot, if you shoot yourself in the foot, you actually might have something to show for it, which, of course, would be a, a foot with a hole in it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> very good. Very good. And I guess just one other thing to mention there is uh, the, these movements can't ever end. I mean, once you or I guess they can, but just, just bear with me here a moment. Um, but uh, but obviously, you know, as the group gets larger and, you know, there's membership fees and all of that. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's growing. There's a there's a large, uh, you know, uh, financial base. Uh, there always has to be something there. There's always something that they can, you know, scout us, uh, you know, scrounge up uh, that can be, you know, a goal of the movement, uh, you know, for. Uh, for you know the civil rights movement, uh, okay, so black people are are now considered you know uh, uh, you know full human beings, and uh, they can vote and they can do all of these things. So what's next? Well, uh, they got to you know got to kind of uh, you know invent something, uh, or you know the, the the women's rights movement or the uh, um, the gay rights movement. I mean, they're, there's they they they're going to keep these things going because there's a, there's a large financial base. Yes, and and one final thing before we move on to the next one, uh, Vanu is not a movement. It is specifically against that uh, kind of collective movementism and so forth. So yes, Vanu is not a movement. I never want to hear people saying anything uh, to where they are essentially claiming that it is the Vanu movement. If you say, like, don't no, do that, no. don't do that, guys, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, very good. So, so I guess uh, we mentioned utopias and collective movementism. Um, I guess any anything on cultural revolution. I, I guess the the only thing I can I can really think of is is that they they don't really exist. <laughs> they've never they've never really really happened. I don't think. Well, even even if if the cultural revolution could work at least in some circumstances and you know certain places, certain times with certain types of people and so forth, even if that's the case. It's at best a huge opportunity cost. I mean, think about all the time and effort spent on ex ex uh, exhorting people and proselytizing and persuading them to to your point of view through rigorous, uh, I, I don't know, clever arguments or something. So, I mean, at that point, it's like, yeah, even if cultural revolutions were efficacious, at best, you're still talking about something that has a pretty high opportunity cost that's starting to approach that of political crusading yes yes and i'm and i would say you know a, a low rate of success like a, a very low rate of uh, success uh so so there is that as well uh, i guess anything else there or uh you ready to move forward let's keep going okay so what one note here uh we're going to go a little out of order uh for purposes of subject matter um so we'll discuss episode number eight which is libertarians and coercivists momentarily so uh episode number nine is the status serve all society uh import export so um this is where we uh where we release the formula uh political crusading plus controlled schizophrenia plus collective movementism equals the servile society um so i guess we'll we'll, we'll do the definitions here uh kyle what is the servile society the servile society is defined as a society that does not respect self-ownership or individual liberty but rather heralds the supremacy of government and authority. In other words, it upholds the collective as superior to the individual. Okay, very good. And uh, what is import-export? Import-export is defined as uh, a way of concisely explaining how Venuans, of course, those who have an invulnerability to coercion, relate to the uh, servile society to, to make this a little bit a tiny bit more concrete uh, the Venuans would import goods and knowledge while exporting labor and or products back out to the servile society very good and uh, one directional isolationism one directional isolation uh, is defined as using import export as a way to maintain access to the servile societies shall we say open but not free trading centers through denying them access to a Venuan's home, again, through importing goods and knowledge while exporting labor or products back out to the uh, servile society. Okay, so I think the most important point to make here uh, is that uh, the servile society is the enemy of the Venuan. 
So that's just the most important thing right there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Kyle. Uh, about the one directional isolationism, if people kind of keep in mind like the old English adage about a man's home is his castle, that would be a very simple way of conceptualizing one directional isolation. So basically keep people out of, out of your um, venuums, the place or situation of an invulnerability to coercion. So basically like your Vanu shelters, if you will. Uh, you know, keep the coercers out of your, your homes, your shelters and all that, yet uh, still be able to conduct some degree of, of uh, contact with, with, with the outside world, as it were, right? Uh, and, or as Rayo kind of mentioned elsewhere, the uh, communication and freighting services of, of the Servile Society in particular in order to facilitate import-export. Yes. Uh, yes, that is true, and I want to make that. I want to make this point here, just because I'm not. I'm not sure who who all listens to the Bonnie podcast. We may have some primitivists here, but uh, this is also the episode where we laid out, uh, you, you know, kind of Rayo's thoughts on you know primitivism uh, and how uh, they are, you know, um, they are you know far outmatched because they don't uh, they don't uh, they don't know what that they don't know the technology of the servile society. Whereas with import export, uh, where you it, it's it is minimal contact. Uh, but you can, you know, you kind of, you kind of keep up with the te technology, uh, and you don't, uh, uh, you, you are not, you haven't been out in the woods for, you know, say 50 years, uh, you know, back, uh, back when people were using typewriters, say, and then now, uh, there's, there's drones, and you see a drone flying out above, and you have no idea what the hell it is. Uh, so, so that's kind of another important aspect of import export. So you, you kind of stay up to date with, uh, with, with the, the technology out there, and also, you know, the tools of, of the coercers. Yes. So uh, again, that that's kind of rather significant. So this isn't like a completely uh, one hundred percent, you know, isolation from the servile society. It's it's a way of conceptualizing it in the sense of that it provides for survivability, and import export kind of allows venuans to be as invulnerable to coercion as possible while being able to survive. At least until such time they they are they have uh, developed their competency, which we'll get to here in a moment, uh, in in terms of um, you know actually developing skills and techniques for for being better and more invulnerable to coercion. Yes, yes, indeed. So so I guess any any I don't I don't have anything else there other than uh, then I'll, I'll kind of reiterate this that the Servile Society is the enemy of the Venuan. Um, so I, I think that's important to reiterate over and over and over again. Uh, but uh, uh, any any thoughts there? Yeah, uh, what what anarchists would conceive of as the state, uh, the state is part of the servile society, but it's not the totality of it because you also have to consider things like social norms. And at times, certain social norms are favorable to statists. Uh, things like snitching, for instance. Uh, you know, they uh, the government. Uh, last time I checked, the government, the state does not uh, does not has does not <laughs> not yet anyway hasn't made it a law to force and coerce people into becoming snitches. People do that voluntarily uh, for one reason or another. So that kind of is getting more into the into like cultural norms and such. And so the servile society is broader than just the state. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so let's move on to uh, episode number ten. Uh, which is mean time to harassment. So uh, obviously we'll start with the uh, definition, Kyle. What is uh, mean time to harassment? Mean time to harassment, MTH, is defined as the strength of Vanu, usually expressed in years. MTH is typically used to gauge the profitable viability of concealing a Vanuum relative to one's competency at Vanumi. Venuum, of course, being the place or situation of an invulnerability to coercion. Vanumi being the art of uh, developing the skills, essentially, of an in of the invulnerability to coercion. Okay, very good. So I want to uh, uh, mention the chart. Uh, if you've listened to that episode and you still haven't looked at that chart, uh, you need to go do that. Uh, uh, well, you, oh, you should have already done it, but you know the the best time uh, the best time is uh, yesterday, but uh, the next best time is today. So um, go take a look at that uh, at uh, Bidby Vani Podcast forward slash ten. Uh, the picture is there on that page, but uh, but this chart, um, this is something that Rayo included in his book in his book, Vanu: The Search for Personal Freedom. Uh, and again, you have uh, on the vertical axes, you have the three days, uh, I guess the the degree of Vanu and MTH, so it's it's years. And then on the horizontal axis, you have uh, um, summer survival, all weather survival, um, comfortable home, small workshop, small manufacturing, light industry, heavy industry. Um, and, and this was one of our longer episodes. So I guess just to, to, to put it briefly here, Kyle, I think uh, um, so. Yeah. The, so MTH is a, a way to measure, you know, uh, what, what's your what's your competency level is. So if you um, if you aren't very competent, you won't be able to participate in, you know, high level. Uh, you won't be able to, you know, have a, a high level venuum. 
Um, so it'd be more you'd be more relegated to things like uh, uh, Van Nomadism, Wilderness Vanu, um, uh, th things more like that. So now, if you have a higher competency level, uh, you might be able to, you know, uh, um, you know, have some sort of like a uh, an underground workshop, a hidden workshop, uh, or something along those lines. And if you're very very competent, uh, which this was kind of you know part of less of the focus, uh, but like uh, small uh, like small manufacturing, light industry, and heavy industry. Um, <laughs> those are, uh, are very large operations, uh, and I don't think, uh, really anybody, uh, or very, very few people, uh, the majority of, uh, of the listeners of this podcast probably aren't ready for that yet. So, um, so it, it relates to the, the competency and what, and how much activity you're able to participate in, uh, in your venue. So Kyle, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, obviously we're, we're, we're doing this in broad brushstrokes and uh, transitory passing in this overview here. So what I will just say is that in terms of uh, vanumi, the art of achieving uh, an invulnerability to coercion, the, the way that you can increase activity while also maintaining or increasing uh, vanu is, is really, to make this a, a little bit more concrete and just to kind of just give one of like each of the extremes from like a level competency all the way up to h level competency this is activity ranging from like wilderness survival and or being homeless all the way up to something like a private city and what would be involved in actually like making those things happen and like all this this entire spectrum of of competency and activity uh, in between uh, including things like, you know, living in a tiny house, for example, not limited to that, and 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 other things. So there's there's a very wide range here and all that. And and what's valuable about MTH is that it's a way of gauging the efficacy of Vanu. Yes, yes. So Rayo, uh, um, you know, laid out a, a way to gauge the efficacy um, right from the start. So I think that's uh, it's definitely fantastic. And again, uh, TV or uh, <laughs> Vanu podcast number or Jesus. Vani podcast forward slash ten uh, to view that uh, to view that image. Uh, definitely recommend uh, you do and do it frequently. Uh, so anything else on that, Kyle? I just say that um, if you, if your MTH is so low that it's basically approaching zero or is zero, uh, you might be a political prisoner. Just saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, okay, so uh, episode number 11, a case for non-coercion based on rational self-interest. Um, so really no definitions other than, you know, maybe the, uh, uh, the non-aggression principle, the initi initiation of force, uh, you know, is immoral, um, self-defense is okay. That's pretty much the, the very base way of, of putting it. But, uh, but essentially what we did in, in this episode was we, we read uh, uh, Rayo's article, article with that same title, um, you know, it was, it was written back in the 60s. I don't remember exactly when it, when it was written, uh, but in the 60s sometime. And uh, he kind of uh, laid out uh, the, the non-aggression principle before it was the non-aggression principle. Uh, so we, we kind of gave you an insight into, uh, into, you know, kind of some of Rayo's ethical stances. We had some issues with it, uh, which uh, um, that's not the first article we've, we've had issues with, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just kind of a, a more insight into, into the man behind, uh, uh, the main man behind Vanu. And then also, you know, uh, um, you know, getting a little ethical on you. Uh, so, so Kyle, any, anything else to add there? Well, I think there, um, if we could take maybe a moment or two here, there, I think mm -hmm. there are three terms that do need to be defined here because it is relevant, because this was the most philosophically heavy, I think, of, of the material. So the non-aggression principle is defined as a moral axiom that absolutely forbids all coercion and initiatory force. Such an ethic upholds the principle of self-ownership. Uh, the NAP is argumentatively justified through argumentation ethics. Um, and then I think related to that, too, is self-ownership, right? Uh -huh, correct. Yeah. So self-ownership is defined as a moral axiom that justifies the existence of the free market by upholding individual property rights Self-ownership is argumentatively justified through argumentation ethics, which then, of course, um, have to define argumentation ethics. And this is and this is really kind of key because I this was as was mentioned earlier. This was mentioned in the collective movementism episode, but I think it was also mentioned in in this one on uh, the rational Correct. case, right? So argumentation ethics is defined as a logical proof that demonstrates the performative contradictions within all political arguments, except those justifying private property. It upholds the validity of the non-aggression principle and the self-ownership axiom 
by showing that individuals who argue with each other have not only forsworn coercion, that is the initiation of the use of force, but have also affirmed property rights in the moment simply due to their own exercise of such rights within the very act of arguing itself. Fundamentally, as a concept, it insists upon integrity by steadfastly opposing hypocrisy. Now, to be fair, let me just add one more thing here. I don't think Re uh, argumentation ethics wasn't around when Rayo wrote mm -hmm. that. No. So, so he was kind of broaching it more, I, I guess, in some ways, I guess, a utilitarian approach, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, I don't think we we, we really pinned down where he was coming. Like it was a little bit all over the place. Um, I mean, he, he covered he covered quite a bit of ground in, in, in a short paper without elaborating on, on quite a bit of it. But, um, but yeah, I, I'd say yeah, there, there might have been some some utilitarianism uh, um, com, coming from him. And in any case, I, I thought it was good that he at least was was making the effort and not trying to play any games of like public policy, this, that, or other thing, which is or just you know, uh, which is I mean, even that's just a form of political crusading too. So yes, it was it was definitely a fascinating article and and definitely part of the uh, Vanu book. Yes, definitely, definitely. So anything else there, or are we ready to move on to the last uh, uh, couple of episodes we're going to discuss that are very uh, interconnected? Yeah, let's let's get on with those because that's uh, there's some detail there. Okay, so uh, um, and we're gonna like like I said, we're we're going a little out of order because I wanted to you know cover you know the the formula um, you know uh, together. But uh, okay, so so uh, episode number eight, libertarians and coercivists. So this was an article written by Rayo uh, that was not included in the book. Thankfully, God, thank, thankfully, thankfully, um, yeah, John Fisher was smart enough not not to include it. Uh, but essentially, what what Rayo was trying to do was you know uh, provide definitions of what libertarians and coercivists are. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and then he subcategorized, you know, the, 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 uh, um, the, uh, what did he call them? Uh, he called them the, uh, the co well, yeah, the coercers, so that the, the subcategorized the coercers and also the libertarians, and it was just full of issues. Uh, some of the, you know, the, the subcategorizations of the, of the libertarians could also be classified as, you know, the coercers and, uh, some of his definitions of, of those things and, and the, the, and the, I guess the labels he used were were not were, were not great. So there there were a lot of issues with it. Uh, uh, there there really were a lot of issues with it. And this was one of the very few very few episodes where, uh, yeah, we we kind of you know ripped him and whipped him a new one on this one. So uh, <laughs> for you, Kyle. Uh, yeah, I mean the the article was really just kind of a draft version more than I mean that was kind of the impression I got. Yes. Yes. So um so episode number twelve. Um, which, yeah, I guess you know, kind of preface it by saying we, uh, we thought that was so bad, Kyle decided to, you know, write a redux version of that. So Libertarians and Coercivists Redux. Uh, and I think you actually named it Libertarians and Authoritarians, right? Yes, yes, I did, because I thought that was, uh, I mean, that's usually what the dichotomy is usually thought of as, and I thought it was more accurate. Yes. So I guess tell us a little bit about a little bit about uh, uh, about uh, the 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 article, and also, you know, if you want to go ahead and just provide the, like I said, be the overview of the episode too. But uh, but yeah, go ahead. Okay, so basically I, I tried to rewrite uh, Rayo's article, so I thought it was more, because I, I saw the spirit of it, I saw where he was going with it, and, and I liked kind of the approach he gave, and I tried to be as faithful as I could, and some of like the concluding articles that he had, obviously I just copied over to mine and, you know, added, I think I added maybe something about like, you know, some specific things like 3D printing or, or some other things, but generally speaking, I try to keep it as, as good as possible, and yes, I added a paragraph or two about argumentation ethics, obviously, um, but I did correct some things I thought were, were incorrect. So like, for example, when he was describing like there's two type, you know, like the, the two types of authoritarians, right? Um, he said there were two types of coercivists and he described it the way he did. I thought one was accurate about like criminals or people who personally coerce others. But then he incorrectly mentioned something about felons, which was kind of a bad way of putting because there's perfectly innocent people who are felons. So I instead said, okay, they're just statists. Yeah. So. Yeah, so so instead of saying, you know, uh, or excuse me, instead of saying status and, and felons, I said, okay, there's criminals and fel uh, and statists. So, uh, see, I'm e even I'm tripping up a little bit. Oops. But <laughs> but yeah, I, I was basically just kind of just kind of rewriting uh, his, his article, as it were. Sorry, I didn't mean to confuse anybody, but unfortunately, um, and, and it was kind of interesting, too, because in a sense, if you think about it, Rayo was trying to def uh, was trying to define the different factions of of the people who are i guess you could say against liberty and then those who are for it um when i was rewriting it i then i i did add like i did add the uh, eugenicists because he had racists which i do agree with him about but then there's like okay well 
you know, what about the people who want to exterminate other humans that they've des- that they've deemed undesirables, right? That's not exactly mm-hmm. the same as subject uh, as sub- forcible subjugation of people, which is what racists want to do, generally speaking. Um, I then, you know, there was also the different types of libertarians, and that one I had to do a real overhaul on. And uh, and, because- and and, and, and you know, for that one, it was kind of just the various anarchic schools of thought, right? Generally speaking, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of looking at it again real, real quickly. Uh, I guess the closest it gets to limited government would be the panarchists. But then again, even with minarchism, I, you know, I threw minarchism as, as being authoritarians. Yes, yes. And that might be, uh, uh, well, actually, for, for folks that are still listening to this podcast, probably not be too, too controversial. But, uh, oh, but yeah, if you throw minarchists in with, uh, with you know, the, the, the authoritarians, oh, boy. Um, especially like the, the really limited government folks. Uh, but, yeah, I'm uh, sorry, but constitutional constitutionalists are socialists with their public roads mm-hmm. and their public schools and their public this and their retirement pension, you know, socialized retirement, the socialist insecurity, which may, actually some of them are more in favor of than not. You know, public, 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 and that's before even getting to public lands. Oh, don't forget public roads too, right? You know, it's just like you know, wow, tragedy of the commons, much. Yes, and, and how are those things uh, funded and put together? Well, by uh, um, you know by the the authoritarian uh, um, theft known as taxation. So right. Um, so so there is that too. There is that. So so I guess uh, any 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 closing thoughts on you know uh, libertarians and coercivists uh, episode eight or number twelve? I, I would just say that uh, when I was uh, rewriting Rayo's article, I think I added a few paragraphs at the at the end of it because it, it kind of felt awkward the way that he ended his. Like he almost just kind of like ran out of time. Is kind of the impression I got. And I felt that there needed to be at least like another paragraph or two basically saying, OK, now that we've identified the libertarians and we've identified the authoritarians, now what? What's 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 the action portion? I figured, well, I want to have like a couple of paragraphs on on what the libertarian strategies are. And that's when I li- listed both agorism and vanuism and then kind of kind of, you know, kind of try to veer it off into uh, direct action more broadly. Okay. Very good. Very good. And I guess one one other one other thing here, and you know, this is a lesson that uh, I mean that we that we that uh, um, that I know I I I've uh, I, I I could use, and, and Kyle, maybe you as well, and and probably some of you out there as well. But uh, whenever you're going to publish a piece of content, uh, you know, fact check and uh, make sure to have it proofread, uh, uh, lest you look like uh, like Rayo did, uh, and uh, you might get critiqued thirty years down the road whenever you screwed up. So, uh, <laughs> so there there is that too. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes it's always good to, you know, do mutual aid with folks. And so, yeah, if you're producing alternative media content, you know, it's sometimes good. Hey, you know, hey, buddy, you know, hey, can you proofread my article or, or whatever? Right. And and so, you know, there's nothing wrong with favor trading and, and all of that. Actually, many of us actually kind of go off of that. Right. Yep. That's that's kind of uh, <laughs> the way the way I've, I've done things for a couple of years. I know that's how you've done things, done things as well. So, yep. Um, I guess uh, you want to kind of begin to, to close out here. Yep. All right, so uh, so I guess the the first point here is that uh, you know most activists aren't ready for Vanu, as they haven't dropped the political crusading, controlled schizophrenia, and collective movementism. So uh, you know, w- w- and I guess another reason why um, you know this is why why season one is important is you know it, I mean it, it, for for folks that you know would would if we were to start with the action, um, then um, would, which would have been bad obviously. Then uh, um, you know some of the activists might have you know wasted time listening to that, uh, might have been a waste of time for them, uh, and uh, um, they realize that they can't do uh, um, those things. Um, so you know, um, as far as opportunity costs, I mean, might have saved them some time. They listened to those episodes and they said, okay, yeah, this isn't for me. You know, I want to run for pol- I want to run for president in 2020. Uh, <laughs> so 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 yeah, the, for those activists that are still involved in those things, uh, yeah, unfortunately, pr- uh, probably probably not ready for Vanu. Um, but uh, um, but if you're still listening, I mean, I'd go back and listen to those episodes again, uh, and, and really try to you know do some do some you know real deep thinking um, about about uh, what you want from your future, and uh, if, if if those things will uh, you know help you get to that goal. Uh, so uh, um, what do you think, Kyle? Well, I, I think something else too is is kind of as a uh, a, 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 hmm, a motivational factor, shall we say? So. You know, obviously, as as we you know start to kind of segue into season two here, when we're going to talk more about nuts and bolts type of things, and uh, like like for example, just to use just one as 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 an example, uh, the van nomadism. Uh, you know, I, I can I can imagine maybe a few people saying things like, "Why am I living in a van?" And it's my, like, "Okay, my car broke down. Why do I keep I keep having to deal with this stuff? Is it really worth it?" 
Right. And see, that's why we and that's why, ladies and gentlemen, we, we had to have season one be about the philosophy of Vanu, because later on, when we're when we're talking shop and getting into uh, more nuts and bolts type materials, uh, should people decide to actually, uh, per, you know, <laughs> do some of those things. And then, you know, once they start hitting obstacles, as inevitably happens when you try to adapt a technique to your own uh, personal circumstances and such, at some point, some people might feel, uh, get a little case of uh, give up itis, shall we say. <laughs> and, and in order to deal with that, in order to cope with that, that's why there is season one. Because season one really is the why of Vanu as well. Like, why, why, why bother? Why bother with an invulnerability to coercion in the first place? That's kind of been the, uh, not necessarily the how, that's season two, but the why of it is really kind of the point of it. And so, yeah, so in the, so even though uh, we'll be going more into nuts and bolts stuff in season two, at some point people might start getting, uh, feel a little defeatism here and there. And it's like, okay, so when you start feeling that way, you know, it's just as a psychological thing or whatever, uh, go back and listen to some of the season one stuff and remind yourself why you were doing this in the first place. Yes, and when, when you when you do inevit inevitably hit some of those obstacles, those those kind of roadblocks, uh, if it's fan nomadism that might be too literal, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean you you, you get so you get you get into some of those those tough spots and uh, and and you, you kind of think back to it and you're like you know this is this sucks you know it sucks but uh, you know uh, it was better than you know being it's better than you know being vulnerable to coercion um, most of the time so. I can also imagine. I can also imagine somebody, you know, like like with uh, maybe like uh, that that one level of competency regarding like the tiny houses. I can imagine somebody whining. I used to live in a Mick mansion with so much room. Why am I living in a tiny house? I mean, look, people can come up with excuses all day, and, you know. And obviously, I've hypothesized hypothesized about them in my own head. And it's like, okay, but that's why we had to do the season one stuff because this is the why of it. This is why you're even bothering at all. And um, I think that's very important because a lot of times people want to jump into the how of something without understanding the why first. And so in order to kind of incrementally develop, I guess what you could call a curriculum of Vanu, that's why season one had to be about the philosophy of Vanu and explaining why things are the way they are and explaining why Rayo was the way that he was. Indeed, I think one other one other uh, kind of thing to take away here, um, you know, is as far as why season one is important is, I mean, I know too many folks, uh, you know, uh, political crusaders. I'll see a, a handful of them or so at the uh, Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest, unfortunately. Um, but uh, but you you kind of look like an idiot whenever you're out there, you know, promoting agorism and mutualism and things, and then you run for run political office, run for political office. So you know, um, you know, season one kind of you know it can it can you know. Um, <laughs> you know, reinvigorate the the integrity if it was gone before, uh, or if you you know you compromise in some places, and uh, it can help you you know remain uh, intact with integrity uh, later on, uh, and not compromise with with coercers uh, and authoritarians. Yeah, exactly. So in in a lot of ways, it's myth busting, isn't it? It's uh, it's reinvigorating good old fashioned skepticism, like not accepting certain uh, claims based on blind faith. Uh, whether they, and especially if they later turn out to be actual falsehoods or, or mysticisms or things just blatantly just not true. And, um, and also, and also it's kind of a little bit of a side note. Think about the celebritarians, folks, for a moment. Um, like how, how much truth, I mean, I remember, Shane, you've probably heard this over the years. We're, we're spreading the truth, man. Really? Really? <laughs> Really, how much? Here's a question for everyone to ask themselves: How much truth are the celebritarians really spreading? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thought mm, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, so I guess uh, if any um, any closing thoughts, Kyler? I'll, I'll kind of uh, begin to to lay out uh, you know the, the the important closing notes as far as uh, you know ending season one. I would say this. I think people are a little too impatient and overly eager when they want when they're learning about something new and they want to basically kind of jump into the nuts and bolts and stuff, which which in some sense is fine, but if they don't understand why it is the way it is, and they kind of have almost this quasi snobbish attitude towards I, I think what would be fair to describe as philosophizing, 
I think that's really kind of showing that they're not really emotionally mature for uh, the, um, I'm going to be perfectly honest, for the struggles that they would otherwise be soon enduring. Because, you know, this is not, um, you know, life can be, can get very simple. That doesn't therefore necessarily mean it's going to be easy either. Because it's easy to go political crusading. It is easy to be a controlled schizophrenic, and it is very, very easy to do your collective movementism, which really, just those three elements, it's extremely easy to promote and be a part of and, and be a sycophant for the servile society. Almost, almost, hard, uh, almost kind of seems, seems, seems like a scam, right? Uh, you know, like mm -hmm. a get-rich-quick scheme? Ooh, it's almost too easy. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the entire establishment, this entire system, man, is, is one get-rich-quick scheme, except without the rich part. It's, it's just doing yeah, it things comes, it quick. It comes with, with, pover with poverty, and, and, with, with poverty beatdowns, and murder. <laughs> yeah, don't forget central banking and many other evils. That would, of course, be its own episode, right? You know, the whole list of grievances more precisely. But, but, but just for the purposes of, of, of kind of concluding season one here regarding the philosophy of Vanu, it's that there is a time and a place for philosophizing. And I will meet some people halfway when they're like, well, don't philosophize all the time. And it's like, okay, I think that's fair. However, I don't think the opposite reaction of don't philosophize ever, I, I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong because there is so much, I mean, people. <laughs> there are people in the alternative media that have said things over the years, Shane, maybe you've heard this too about the mainstream media spreading lies about XYZ events or, or whatever the subject matter is. And it's like, okay, well, in order to combat that, yes, yeah, sometimes citizen journalism is is the way to do it, you know. But but there's other times where it's things more of a philosophical nature, things involving uh, you know topics like social contracts. I mean, there's no there's no like citizen journalist, you know, hunting down the details of a story, go interview people, go grab documents to solve that. That's more of a philosoph the social contracts, for example, or it's more mm -hmm. of a philosophical issue. So citizen journalism doesn't solve all problems regarding mainstream media uh, lying and all that. Other times, you really do need to sit down and philosophize. You know, just saying, folks. Yes, yes, and very, yeah, very well said, very well said. So, uh, so um, obviously, season two will focus on part two of Rayo's book uh, titled Practice. We look at what Rayo said and lay out the strategies, uh, but we will not expand upon them until season three. That will be uh, what we do in season three, and uh, we've already kind of laid out, uh, you know, the schedule for season two, and we've already got a handful of episodes for season three. Um, but uh, but yeah, they're uh, at least going to be twice uh, twice the episode, like twice the amount of episodes for season two. And season three, I don't even want to think about it right now. <laughs> There's going to be so many episodes, so much great content, and uh, uh, so many, so many possibilities that you could, you know, um, you know, implement Bonnie into your own life. So, uh, so there will be an article um, that will be, you know, released uh, uh, along with this with this episode, uh, concluding season one. That's uh, an article Kyle wrote as he's done with uh, most of the episodes in this series so far. Um, and uh, I will also include a download link for the entire season on there. So if you want to, uh, you know, download it all in one click, and uh, you know, if you've got a radio station, uh, like an internet radio station or something, you want to play those episodes, we definitely appreciate it. Uh, we'll make that uh, very, very easy for you. And uh, I guess uh, just I want to remind you about uh, the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest uh, happening from June 22nd to June 26th in Delton, Michigan. Uh, so for more information, just visit mplfest.org. I will be there, and some other folks that that listen to this podcast will be there. We'll have some great conversations about Vanu. Uh, you're definitely going to uh, want to make it out. Also, make sure to shoot us any questions you may have about Rayo, Vanu, or whatever else we have discussed thus far uh, for a future Q&A episode. Again, our emails are shane at vanupodcast.com and kyle at vanupodcast.com uh, or drop us a note on fa on fascist book uh, we definitely would love to get some questions from you and you know just spend some time uh, clarifying some things that may be confusing for you so i think that's all we have thanks so much for tuning in the website is vanupodcast.com we'll talk to you next week